This year, Durham has achieved a unique distinction. It has become the birthplace of two universities. For the new University of Newcastle-upon-Tyne, previously King's College Newcastle, used to be part of Durham University and looked upon Palace Green as its home. But in August this year, Newcastle gained a university in its own right, the only occasion in the history of this country when one university has grown out of another. The old structure of organization needed pulling down, for King's College itself had twice as many students as all the nine Durham colleges put together. And expansion in the heart of Newcastle will continue right into the 1970s, by which time it will have increased by half its present student population of 4,000. This could be called the symbol of the new independence. At least it's as good a name to give it as any other. But there is no doubting the towering practicality of the new physics building, one of the finest and best equipped university buildings in the country. Independence and rapid growth will bring many administrative problems, but college life will remain unshakably the same for students such as Christine Hughes and Derek Sutton. This is the story of the new university as seen through their eyes. Every October, more than 1,200 new students, known as freshers, arrive at Newcastle. For most of them, it's a time of excitement and anticipation, but many may also feel anxious and nervous. This will probably be their first time away from home. They may also worry about how successful they will be. At school, they are likely to have been outstanding. At university, they will probably be no more than average. Some will not even stand the pace of the first year. Five out of every hundred students get no further than the first three terms. But for the moment, they are too busy settling into halls of residence and making new friends. Almost all freshers reside in halls, but move out to digs for their second and third years. On the whole, digs offer more freedom and fewer house rules to be obeyed, such as strict time for meals or visitors. On the other hand, halls generally have pleasanter rooms and more facilities for study and leisure. A considerable part of a student's grant is likely to be spent on books. Indeed, it will be quite easy to spend the whole of a maximum grant of about five pounds a week in this way. It's not unusual for a single book, especially on the science side, to cost two or three pounds or even more. But after spending fairly liberally on books in the first year, most students rely on libraries. There are simply too many books to be read. You couldn't possibly afford them all. One of the freshers' first acquisitions is an academic gown, which will cost him about three pounds. Good morning. Good morning. Can I have a couple of gowns, please? Students are young. Yes, please. Certainly. These are relics from the medieval dress of a scholar, a simple black habit to set him aside from other mortals. Although gowns are derided by so-called progressives, the universities still cling to them. That uh, feels rather strange at first. Yes, they are a student gown, of course. And what do you think of it, Simon? They have to be worn for all academic occasions, for lectures, for meeting one's tutor. If only mother could see me now. Eh? Mm, a real academic. Or for formal dinners such as this. Formal dinners are another part of the traditional ritual of universities. These freshers at the girls' residence are filing in for the first of many such dinners they will have to eat in the course of three years. They are meant to be the climax to a scholar's day. 
the only time when all members of Hall are together, a time for discussing the state of the world or the latest scientific theory. But more likely the talk will be about boyfriends and the latest films. Students eat in the main body of the room, while members of staff and guests sit at high table. Latin grace, which is unintelligible to 99% of those present, is another part of the highly prized traditions. Benedict, hike to our donor, Dominic. Amen. These traditions have been formed over 130 years. For although Newcastle University was created only in August this year, its origins go back to 1834 when the College of Medicine was founded. Less than 20 years later, it became a college associated with the University of Durham. From the earliest days, the medical school has had a very high international reputation. Today, the microbiology department is carrying out fundamental research into the chemistry of living cells and in particular is studying the effects of vitamins and of heat on live organisms. Derek Sutton also works in a lab, but in the physics department. With final exams not far ahead, he cannot afford to waste much time. As a scientist, half his time is spent in lectures and half in carrying out experiments like these. The new seven-story physics building was opened only in March 1962 and contains some of the newest equipment in the country. Physics as a subject of study is developing so quickly, in fact, that much of the equipment in general use now was not even thought of as standard equipment for students ten years ago. Newcastle University is equally proud of its traditional side. Its Morris dancing team has performed in many parts of the country and tours abroad every summer. Christine, like other students, takes a break from work to watch them dance in the quad. The Naval Architecture Department at Newcastle is one of only two in the country. Many graduates from the department go into shipyards to help design ships. One of the most successful, John West, recently received a Duke of Edinburgh gold medal for his design of the Canberra. This testing tank is invaluable in the creation of new designs, for it can simulate the sort of pressure and velocities likely to be encountered by the hull of a completed ship. From theory to practice with the University Sailing Club in Tynemouth Harbour.
Christine, who comes from St. Albans, took up sailing for the first time when she came up to university. She is now in her second year and reading English literature. Each week she attends probably about ten lectures, lasting an hour each. Officially, lectures are compulsory, but in fact, within reason, students tend to please themselves which lectures they go to and which they miss. I'd like to continue last week's discussion of uh, Gulliver's Travel this morning and to begin with some remarks on the end of that book. The book ends with Gulliver, a monomaniac and his last outburst is a piece of petulant and silly defiance. We're not, I think, invited to share... At university, there's only one absolutely compulsory engagement, a meeting with your tutor. Otherwise, you're free to study what you like, but with the knowledge that exams are never far away. Each year, students in the fine arts department hold an exhibition of their work. The department has a very high reputation throughout the country. Victor Passmore, one of the most successful of modern painters, was on the staff until recently. The exhibition gives students a chance to discuss and criticise each other's efforts. Stuff set in landscape as sculpture forms. Possibly, yes, this sort of... It might have been an un, sort of subconscious idea, you know, initially. Yeah. And uh, usually either just taking simple shapes, sort of uh, very two-dimensional shapes, sort of set flat. The idea of stones taking an earth bank, yes. imagine an earth bank sort of cut yes, away. Uh -huh. But then I've moved on to these because they seem more interesting and uh, sort of show this concern with three-dimensional shape in a way. And um, I've taken this as a theme then, more or less starting with these yes. and planning on to that. Building up onto onto that. that. The purpose of art is basically that of visual communication. And this is the problem which I have to face, that um, a person looking at the representation of work can immediately see something with which he is um, familiar, sort of either this scene or else something which he can associate himself, an emotion or a mood, whereas I have none of this at all, that this is almost an intellectual art. And the spectator has to know really something about abstract art before he can begin to understand what and I'm trying to achieve. Courier, the university newspaper with a circulation of about 1,500, is published by students once a week during term. Christine, who is the assistant editor, has been doing an article on lodgings. Well, thanks, Chris. How many words have you got? That's about 1,500. That was about a thousand, you know, really. Well, I couldn't do less than that on the stuff I had. Okay, we'll cut something else to get it in. How did you find the rector? Well, the rector was very helpful. He gave me all the um, stuff he could, you know, because there's been a tremendous amount of trouble over lodgings with them, um, especially with coloured students. Yes, I know. I must have looked through about a hundred places before I found anywhere decent to live. I mean that, too. Yeah. Oh, I think this will do, Chris. You can take and get in touch. Okay. Right. Weekly publication obviously throws a great burden on the student journalists who not only have to collect and type their own stories, but also have to do all the other work involved, apart from the actual printing. Christine's article on lodgings was intended to present university authorities with the alarming condition of many digs. Sports facilities of all kinds are available, and competition between different colleges, or between one university and another, is very keen. Many of the country's top athletes, such as Roger Bannister, Chris Brasher, Chris Chataway, produced their best performances while still students.
for you at the party last night. No, I'd been up half the night finishing an essay. Never mind, you didn't miss much. It was lousy. Well, don't forget, there's an SLC meeting next Tuesday. No, I won't, but with these finals coming up, things are getting just that bit dodgy. Yes, that's one thing. At least I haven't got finals. No, but you've got to get through this stuff first, haven't you? Still, never mind. See you on Tuesday. Cheers. Cheers, Eric. The time being 3.45, I declare this meeting of the Students' Representative Council to be open. Are there any apologies for absence? Mr. Wilson. Mr. President, I received apologies for absence from Mrs. Buckley, Forrest, and from Miss Jones and Miss Martindale. Are there any further apologies for absence? There being none, I shall move on to item three on the agenda, minutes of the last meeting. The Student Representative Council is a governing body of students for students. It deals with every aspect of a student's life, from the organizing of sports and social clubs to the provision of coffee bars. A number of subcommittees are formed by it to run special activities. There is one to organize rag appeal week for charities, another to produce the newspaper, a third to arrange the graduation ball. The amount of funds that each particular society or activity is to receive is also decided by the council and is, understandably, one of its trickiest problems. SRC is the official contact between students and the university authorities, and frequent discussions are held between the two bodies. If any new measures are to be introduced, the authorities are likely to discuss them first with the council. SRC is thus an excellent means for students to learn responsible administration. The president, who is elected by all the students, is in a position of considerable power and prestige. At this meeting, Mr. Robson, a council member, feels that RAG is falling into disrepute because of unofficial pranks and proposes this motion. And, sir, I would like to propose the following uh, proposition. That students found engaging in an unofficial stunts in RAG week be liable to disciplinary procedure which is exemplified in the chapter four of the bylaws in the Constitution. Does Mr. Moling have council's permission to speak? Aye. 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 Thank you. Mr. Moling. <coughs> Mr. President, sir, Mr. Robson has just been um, telling us about the disciplinary con controls which RAC Central Committee hopes to um, have approved by council to impose on offenders during RAC week. Does this mean that now we, go, we tell Rag Central before we go out and commit an illegal stunt instead of just going out and committing it? I would suggest, Mr. President, sir, that uh, this is another in instance of Rag Central's well-known uh, insatiable desire for increased power, and I must wholeheartedly oppose this motion. <laughs> Underlying everything else is study and exams. A good library is the basis of any university. It can do without first-class accommodation, it can do without sports grounds, it cannot do without an excellent library. There must be books on every conceivable subject and on every aspect of every subject. If a student cannot find a particular book in his university library, he's not likely to find it anywhere else apart from the British Museum. And besides the latest publications, there must be books that have been long out of print. This is one of the main obstacles facing a new university. Most students, like Derek here, spend much of their time in the library, and as examinations grow near, they are likely to spend whole days there. Reading, noting, trying to soak up every particle of information that may prove useful once the examination has begun. Students themselves call this process swatting, swatting, swatting. And it goes on all day and all night. There is no such thing as an eight-hour day. You go on until the brain gives up or the refreshment gives out and your eyes can take no more.
Then you go on after that. Until, despite your sternest efforts, you fall asleep. Toward the end of a three-year course, a future career becomes a pressing problem. All universities now have one or more appointments officers to guide students. How are you getting on? The course going all right? Not too bad. Good. When I last saw you, you uh, were rather undecided about what you wanted to do. Have you uh, got any more sort of firm views about this now? Or? Well, I think I pretty well decided on teaching. But uh, you're thinking... Appointments officers are members of staff with a sympathetic interest in students and their careers. Oh, yes. For this important interview, Derek wears a shirt and jacket for about the first time since he came up to university. It's a sign that the conventions of the outside world are approaching. One cannot, unfortunately, remain a student all one's life. Every spring, many industrial companies send their representatives around the universities in what is known as the grad drag to recruit potential graduates. In other cases, where there are likely to be more graduates than vacancies, it will be up to the student himself, guided by the appointments officer, to take the initiative. Some graduates, if they do very well in their examinations, may come back to university for another two or three years studying to gain a master's degree or doctorate of philosophy. Students intending to teach in grammar schools, as with Derek, must return for a year to gain a diploma in education. Our normal procedure with people who go to take the diploma of education is that uh, either I or one of my colleagues goes across to the department and, and gives a talk about applying for teaching jobs and something about the less obvious things you can do when you're trained as a teacher, uh, some of the things you can do when you've got a bit of experience as a teacher, but not before. Um, but um, anyway, we can talk about that uh, when the time comes. Every student faces an examination at the end of each academic year, that is to say, in June. About a fortnight before the examinations begin, the timetable giving the time and place of each exam is published. Students hurry to find out the worst. Now there is not a second to be lost. The casual, easy-going nature of university life changes, quickens. Even while walking between one lecture and the next, there is time to read a few lines. And as long as the sun shines, steps in the quad provide an adequate alternative to the library, which by now is packed with feverish students mugging up on art or archaeology, French or mathematics, metallurgy or traffic engineering. In the chemistry department, students hurry to complete essential experiments. But even in the bustle, they still have time for a joke.
and as suddenly as the heated, last-ditch activity began, it ends. Probably a fortnight and all, no more. Now there is no more time. The last books have been read, the last experiments done, or just left. Now there is only the exam paper, the cruel clock, and another hundred students locked up with you. And you're kicking yourself for not having read a particular book, or for not swatting up a particular question. You guessed that it might be coming, but it looked too obvious. But somehow you managed the necessary four questions in three hours, and the eight or ten papers in the week. And the chemistry lab is silent and forgotten. The corridors are deserted. The lecture rooms are bare. And then the release when it's over. But despite the jubilation, relief is not quite complete, for there is still the tension of waiting for results to see how well or how badly you did. But there is no more you can do now except wait and sing. and the singing will go on very late into the night. And in the morning, or rather a few mornings later, the publication of results, And later still, graduation itself, when each successful candidate, watched by his parents, shakes hands with the vice-chancellor as a symbol that he is now a graduate of the university. This congregation is held up for the purpose of conferring grief. Vice-Chancellor, I certify that all the candidates to be presented at this congregation have complied with all the conditions required by the University. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, the Dean of the Faculty of Science prays me to present candidates who are qualified to proceed to the degree Bachelor of Science. A simple but impressive moment to end what may have been the most formative and questioning years of your life. But it is not really the end, only a continuation. Derek is coming back next year for his diploma in education. Chris will have her finals. And even after that, when they've left Newcastle altogether, they will still be learning all the time. That is why the story of the new University of Newcastle upon Tyne has no beginning and no end. Okay. It is as continuous as life itself. Thank you.